Well, good day, everyone. Thank you for attending our session. I'm going to speak a little bit on our mediation response unit. My name is Raven Cruz Loiza, and I am the mediation response unit, otherwise known as MRU unit coordinator. And I will be talking to you a little bit about my program today and perhaps how you may um, develop some interest in implementing a, a similar program in your area, or maybe you have questions about how to get started or what have you, and hopefully we can answer some of those questions. So when we get into the information here, we are a city of Dayton in Ohio, a city of Dayton program that is under the umbrella of the Dayton Mediation, excuse me, Dayton Mediation Center. And we formulated after the murder of George Floyd and several others um, in 2020, and there were lots of police reform talk happening around the nation. Our city took that a step further and said, yes, we're gonna have these talks, but let's put some action and then let's put some money behind it. Overall, there were working groups that were formulated to focus on different areas of police reform for our city. With all of the recommendations that were handed down, there were 142. Some of them were, uh, I, they were all important. So some of them were uh, addressing body cam and use of force things. Some were different policy changes. And then other, I, or other things that developed from this police reform were programs, programs such as my own. Um, we are an alternative emergency response unit and we respond to low, uh, low emergent 911 and police calls for the city of Dayton. Anything that involves people in conflict or people in crises, but not weapons. Currently, um, we have a team of eight individuals that are at risk, that come from a variety of backgrounds, from law enforcement, uh, social services, children's services, victim services, juvenile probation, juvenile detention, corrections. We have a slew of, of folks and we have a couple of licensed folks on our on our team as well. So we chose to develop our team to reflect the community that we serve. Um, telling a little bit about us, what is our purpose? The overall goals of our program are to improve positive police community relations. And how do we do that? Number one, we're providing alternatives to police response for some of those lower emergent 911 and police calls, those calls for conflict, those calls of people in, in crises or those that aren't getting along. In addition, Overall, we want to reduce the number of 911 calls for those low emergent situations, allowing officers more time to take the higher emergent calls, but providing that alternative for our communities, it, which comes into our third goal is providing an alternative. There are some folks that have not had positive interactions or lived experiences, and therefore may be very unlikely or not likely at all to reach out in a time of conflict or crises due to past experiences. So we want to work on um, uh, providing an alternative for those. And when we talk about low emergent calls, this is what we're referring to. They are, of course, we must keep in mind that while it may, need not, may not be a crisis to one of us, it is still a crisis to them. And that's an important aspect to understand. So when are calls appropriate for my team? Anything that involves noise complaints, pet complaints, loitering, beggaring, juvenile complaints that aren't higher level felonies, uh, neighbor disputes, roommate troubles, disorderly subjects, calls for peace officers, such as I need to exchange goods because my ex and I are no longer getting along and I don't feel safe to go and retrieve my items by myself. So I would like someone to stand by. Or it could look like um, a child custody exchange. Sometimes parents aren't in spaces where they can navigate those situations in a, con in a, in a conducive manner. So they want outside assistance. And that's something that we can help. And time will tell you that the less negative interactions that children have with um, law enforcement, the, the better the impact will be later on in life. If they're only seeing police when their their caregivers are arguing or can't get along, that tends to have a negative impact later on. So just keeping those things in mind. Um, if 
anything involves any history of extreme violence or aggression, if there's a weapon present, if there's an injury that resulted from some criminal activity or there um, a higher level crime has been committed, then that's when the calls would be appropriate for police and not our MRU unit. So this is just some data for those of you that like data. Um, they did a um, study over an over a, a two month time frame in the fall of 2021, I believe. And they were estimating of these call types, what are the average number of calls per week? How many of those could be diverted to our mediation response unit? And the, and the total that they came up was more than half of those calls could be handled by someone other than police. So that was interesting information. Um, some of the benefits of having a unit, an alternative unit, um, is that you're going to get a better fit response to those nonviolent disputes, those things that may not need a police presence. In addition, when our teams are coming in and responding, they, the, the folks may have called about a trash can issue with a neighbor, but when you get there and you're talking to them, there's been like seven years of issues going on between the neighbors. So we try to really hit down and get down to the root of the issues, because if we can deal with the root of the conflict, we can reduce those repeated calls later on or the potential for escalation. In addition, because we're handling the lower emergent, we have more time to focus on people in place and their quality of life or whatever challenges that may, may need. And then we could provide follow-up. So maybe we're out and we're talking to a caregiver who's fed up with their juvenile for being unruly or disrespectful or not doing chores or something like that. And they've called the police for police intervention. When we arrive on scene, we first have to practice that crisis intervention, the de-escalation piece. How do we get them from survival brain to thinking brain? How do we get them from thinking in the red, whether weak and self-absorbed, to recognizing and empowering so that they feel stronger and they're able to respond in a different manner. That's our focus. Sometimes that doesn't happen. So with that juvenile and caregiver, it may be something that we de-escalate today and in two days we come back or a week we come back and maybe we hold an on-site mediation or um, maybe we connect them to resources. There's a variety of different things, but we, we do lots of follow-up and case management type of work. Um, also, we work on relationship building to really empower folks to work through some of the challenges that they have, because ultimately people have the answers to their challenges. They just might not be in a frame of mind or a place where they can see or verbalize or, or make those actualize. Um, in addition, we're connected to lots of resources in the community, so we can do warm handoffs, we can take people if transport transportation is a challenge to get to their initial appointments. We offer a plethora kind of wraparound services for that. And then of course, if we're responding, there's a lower likelihood of that potential traumatic police encounter for those with lived experience. And then for our police department, they are spending less time on those calls, those calls that they're really not um, trained and equipped to, to handle. That also makes them available at higher or rapid rate or for a rapid response to those higher priority calls. And then our officers oftentimes are running from traffic crash to uh, homicide. And then from homicide, then we've got uh, child custody exchange. From child custody exchange, we gotta go over here and deal with these neighbors. And after these neighbors, we gotta go deal with an armed robbery. So there's a lot, and there's very, very short periods, if any time for officers to recenter and focus and do those types of things. So this will allow for a little bit more time for that. And in addition to address some of those um, other things, those other crime patterns or challenges that are happening that are best suited for um, for our police, uh, that tends to affect their, their officer morale. And then it also allows them time to be focusing on positive police community uh, re, re, uh, relations and interactions. So there's lots and lots of benefits. One of the questions is how do we respond? So we are unique in that there are lots of programs across the United States in which there are co-response, police and social workers, police and peer educators, police 
those that are peers. There's lots of different variations. Um, some of programs operate uh, through 911, some of them do not, some of them com are community based. So we operate in a different manner. Um, we do not co respond to our calls. So I'm going to give you a couple of ways a call could come into our unit. Number one, someone could call our line and say, Hey, I'm having this issue, and we'll try to do some de escalation over the phone. And if that's not working and an in person response, we will send a two person team to the scene to to work through whatever the the issue at hand or whatever is going on. So we have that. In addition, in the primary way that we receive calls is through our 911 and non emergency number through dispatch. Dispatch will receive a call. Hey, there's a, a male outside the business screaming and acting a fool. We need police. So the dispatcher could do one of two things. They could transfer the number to my call taker. My call taker can chat with the person, try to de-escalate, and if not, send a, a team. Or dispatch can put it on what's called a call board. It's just a list of all of the calls for service um, for police. And we have access. We operate on the same computer and radio system as our police and fire department. So all of the calls for service that come in through the city we have access to those in our vehicles. So we can see that a disorderly subject call came up on the board. We can self-dispatch and we respond. There's no police presence. Now, sometimes people are like, well, what happens if, glad you ask, I'll address that here in just a few moments. So primarily um, we receive calls through our hotline, through dispatch, uh, self-dispatching, What's happening more and more as MRU has become established and they're seeing the value of our unit, police will be on scene with a call and recognize there's no criminality piece of this. These people are in conflict. They need some help. This is outside of my scope of practice. So they will get on the radio. Hey, is MRU available? Can you send, an MR can you send a team? And then MRU will respond to the team and police will leave and then we'll handle the call. That has happened, actually that continues to increase as we get out there and they recognize, oh, there's there's not the police piece, but there's a piece to handle the, the crisis or conflict. So that's been very helpful. And then in addition, we get referrals from police and outside agencies and other folks that we um, engage with our community. And then of course, if we're out and about and people wave us down or ask us, well, or we see people in a in need, who appear to be in distress or needing assistance, we can stop that way too. So there's a variety of ways that, that things can happen. So we have our call taker who's able to take those calls. Then we have our response team. Those are active folks in the field making it happen. We always respond in twos. That's important for people who are, are looking. And then of course, we do follow up. We might say, hey, can we check in with you in a week? Or can we check in with you in a couple of, of months? just depends on the situation and what's happening. We have lots of juveniles and they may have some behavioral challenges and we've connected in the services. So we might follow up. There was one particular case in which there was a nine-year-old in a group home really struggling with some behavior. So we went in there, we had conversations, we worked with the child connecting them to resources. And then we checked in every week for a, for a number of weeks on this juvenile. And they started to look forward. They started drawing us pictures, making us little fidgets and really getting excited about us coming and check because it was something for them to work toward. Um, other things like neighbor disputes, neighbor disputes can get out of hand and you would be surprised at what people call the police for. So it's important a lot of times when we are um, handling those, those also need lots of follow-up and working through. And sometimes it's they're not in a position at that time to mediate or have a conversation. So that's something that we would follow up on. I think it's also important to recognize that we have to define mediation. So when we're saying mediation response, you know, what does that actually mean? Many times people think is mediation is arbitration or I'm coming in, you sit here, you sit here, let's come to an agreement, which that could happen. But really mediation and our transformative mediation model 
we are providing safe spaces for people to have conversations that they may not otherwise have. That is how it that is how mediation works. The person facilitates the conversation, but it's the participants that actually do all of the work. So it's amazing to see that happen. In addition, I want to address concerns about being unarmed. I want people, when people come um, with this, well, what if, what if, let me tell you. So while it may seem very odd to some folks while we're sending unarmed responders, I like to challenge people to look at it from a different perspective. Probation officers, children's services, victim services, health workers, housing authorities, and other, other um, entities are already in our communities and responding to crises and other things in person unarmed. It's not new, it's not something new. It's new to policing and, and getting away from that mindset of always needing an armed officer to respond to some of those. If um, things would get out of hand at a call and maybe a weapon was displayed or violence is utilized, we are on the same radio system. We push that red button and the entire police department will show up with just in a matter of seconds. So we have the ability to reach out if that occurs, but that is not something that's common that happens. So keep that in mind. Currently, our program does not operate 24 seven to 8 p.m. We will soon be moving to Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. And you might be wondering why those hours? We did research on calls for service over a, a good period of time. And from that, it was deemed that the most appropriate calls for service for MRU, the higher, the highest number of calls happened between 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. So that's why those were chosen. We do have the intention of moving to a model that's 24 seven, but we're doing that incrementally to make sure that we are doing, you know, staffing and hiring and retention can be challenges across the nation in almost any field. So we want to make sure that we can sustain what we are providing to our community. Initially, the MRU was not set up to respond to mental health calls. There was another provider in our community that was handling, that was supposed to be working on handling those mental health calls. That did not actuate. So let me just tell you this first. Um, mental health can affect up to 25% of the US population. It's embedded in almost every call, not all, but many. So it's important to have that training, that understanding and that expectation and know what to do when we do run into those. But when the MRU was created, that was not the primary purpose. There was another um, team that was going to be developed. But because that didn't actualize, this is amazing news in that, um, we just received word that we will be getting additional funding and we will be adding a CRU, a crisis response unit, and that unit will focus on all of the calls for mental health that come through our 911 and police system. So that is coming. It's not here yet. So it's really cool to have the MRU and we will soon have the CRU and addressing those calls for service in our community, which I'm really, really looking forward to. If people want to reach us, they are able to reach out to us directly um, at, on our direct line. So that is, a key, that is a possibility. And the more information that we get out to our community, um, the more often that we are getting calls um, on our regular line. Um, some of the program highlights and these stats may not be as up to date. Um, we are a first in the nation mediation based program. We launched in Feb or excuse me, May of 2022. We spent thousands of hours in the community. Originally for our city, they were before our unit came out, they're like, oh, on this side of the city, you're going to have so many more calls. And if you're looking at our mapping of the calls that we did from May of last year till March, you can see it's divided up and spread out fairly well across our community. So that myth was was debunked right away. In March of 2023, we did a little bit of an update for our police 
um, our our street officers and police, and we broke it down. And right here is the important piece, the top five, technically six, call types or neighbor disputes, peace officer or child exchange or property, disorderly subjects, juveniles, noise and welfare checks. And the other piece of that to pay attention to is this 5% referred out. How many calls did we refer back to police or fire? Our system doesn't differentiate currently between fire and police, so they're lumped all together. The three reasons that something would be referred out would be they need a medic. That's the number one reason. There is some criminality piece and a police report is needed. That's number two. And then there have been two calls in which weapons have either been displayed or otherwise, and that we did um, ask for police to arrive on scene. Um, but that is what that looks like because that was important to people. It's amazing to see the work that we are doing out there. People called back to 911 saying, hey, I don't know what, they may not know the team. I, those people that you just sent were so helpful. Um, if you're looking at this rooster picture here of one of our responders holding a rooster, uh, long story short, that this was a noise complaint. We arrived on scene. Someone had been complaining about the rooster's cock-a-doodle-dooling in the morning, and it had extended period of time. They were concerned that maybe there were some um, cockfights going on. So we arrived on the scene, we engaged with the person who was super, super angry at first, and then they came down and explained, oh, this is the neighbors, this has been going on for years, and things like that. We engaged with the neighbors, and we were help we were able to provide space for them to work through the resolution, and we learned that some roosters lay blue eggs, so it was quite the experience. Um, if you look at this here, where this responder is holding up, putting up a basketball net, that was a call, well, we received repeated calls in a neighborhood for neighborhood challenges. Kids playing basketball on the street, their balls are bouncing into neighbors' flower beds and making a disaster and upsetting people, and there was arguments. So our responders went out, talked to them, and we noticed that there was a basketball hoop in the backyard. Well, why are we using that? You know, just inquiring. Well, we don't have a net. Oh, okay. So after the call, MRU, drives down to the little store in the corner, buys a net, comes back and hangs it up. We've had zero complaints out of that neighborhood since that call, since we put up that net. We've had things like, this is us trying to rescue a cat. I know you can't see it. Here's the cat. Uh, out of a tree, this was a whole neighbor dispute that had the whole neighborhood up in arms. They were very, very angry. Um, so sometimes it's what we would call simple things but they aren't able to see those because they're in that self-absorption. Uh, we had a young person or a person who a loitering call had come in. This person's loitering on the bench. That would be a call that would be low, very low priority for police and they might not respond for a few hours. Our team was able to go to the scene in a short period of time, engage with the person. They weren't feeling well. A medic was called and then asking them a few additional questions. They explained that they had been or they disclosed that they had been sexually assaulted. So that changed things a little bit, still gave them voice and choice, and they were able to be transported to the hospital and have their kit, their sexual assault kit completed, and, and that process started that way. So we're doing great things out there. We're making it happen. We're helping people. The coolest thing is when we call back to check in, and they're, thank you so much. You listened to me. You were the first person that's ever listened to me. You heard me you things like that that is that is what uh, what keeps us us going Quali quantitative data is great but that qualitative data the storytelling does it every time every time so we are planning to make sure that we expand some of the recommendations that we had for expansion was to add more teams to serve more hours uh utilizing data analysis. And now we're connected with Harvard University who will be coming in soon to start their research um, and evaluation project, which is great. Uh, and then of course, um, developing our dashboard to make sure that we um, we report the what, what we're doing out there and that the public is aware. 
um, because we want to provide the highest quality of services. There are lots of things that go into this type of program. And a question that many people ask are, well, how do I get started? You start with a conversation. Who are the key players? What do we want to do? What do we want to see? Who are the key players? Let's meet the key players. Let's see what they say. So it's a lot of collaboration that goes in in the initial. You're going to get the naysayers, and that's okay. We love naysayers around here because that's just more drive for us to prove how effective alternative programs can be. Um, it's important to get the right people at the table. It's important to communicate with your on-the-ground officers. While being in contact with command staff and those higher up are great, you want to get to the people that you will be working with on the ground. You want to make sure that people are communicating that we're providing holistic type of, type of services, and, and that's a super important. In addition, um, there are different programs across the United States that can help if you are interested in um, beginning a program or uh, developing a program such as this. There are lots of resources um, available to you um, that could be provided if that was something of interest. We are doing great things. We are meeting people where they are at. We have been a mediation center since the 1980s. We've been bringing people in conflict to our center working with them through their crises or th excuse me through their conflict and bringing it from conflict to conversation things that you thought would never ever end have been have been um have improved or have gotten better because of our mediation center and what better way to take that to the people when they are in the conflict and crises that's what we are set out to do and it has been great we have great support. We do walk a fine line. We can't be too over here or too over here because we have to be that middle ground for our community and our police and to really work toward some resolutions that will keep folks safe, that will allow for equitable services to be provided and such. So it's great work we've been doing. And I encourage you, if you have questions, you want more information to reach out because we would be happy to provide that to you. And this is my contact information here. If you choose, I will tell you that email is much better than phone um, at this time because we're working on starting our CRU unit. But I appreciate you being here, you being present, you listening to what we do and how we do it. And if you're interested in more information, I encourage you to reach out. And thank you for being with us today.